Now we've got uh, uh, Monzu Magaji joining us this morning. He is an APC national stakeholder. He was also a member of the APC Presidential Campaign Council for 2019. And he's an engineer. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us today on the program. Good morning to uh, all of you there in Lagos. I know all of us here. Yeah, Mark is not uh, over there in Abuja. She's here with us, so yeah, she'll yeah, be I getting questions from here. <laughs> okay, but, you know, taking a look at what is playing out, I mean, looking at that report uh, just played, several questions, uh, but chief of which for some people will be, in spite of all that is going on, does it come across to you as though anyone is listening or doing something about what's going on? Because it keeps increasing almost on a regular basis. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chamberlain. It comes to me as uh, the system is being overwhelmed, unfortunately. And I think uh, that report is very saddening because uh, to hear citizens basically resigning to their fate in their own country, uh, basically expecting death coming to them any time, it's very unfortunate. I mean, the whole essence of the state is to protect the lives and the property of people, the citizens. I mean, to see Niger state, to think that Niger state is basically a stone throw from the capital is, is to say the least, very, very disheartening. It's honestly, as I was watching the report, and also all the other issues coming across the country, I really feel like we've come to a crossroad where, honestly, we have to evaluate our status as, as a government and also as a nation. This situation we're in is beyond politics. It's just about the ability of the whole country to stand on its feet and defend its citizens. And honestly, um, every suggestion, every help, Every means that is necessary to safeguard the citizens' lives is welcomed. And at this stage, I would like to honestly urge our administration under President Muhammad Buhari to have an open mind in what solution will solve this problem. The citizens have given us mandate, and we've exercised that mandate for six years now. This is me. And therefore, we are in the half term of the second term of this administration. If we do an appraisal, we will safely say that at this point, we should be counting our gains. But unfortunately, we are in fear, we are frustrated, and we are getting to a point where we are losing faith in our own nation. So I will say that this is a very, very important point to reflect and understand that the mandate given to us is for a purpose. And that purpose, the first most important part of that purpose is to safeguard citizens' life. But it's sad that we are not even counting gains of development, economic mm -hmm. prosperity. You know, all the things going on now with the infrastructure development has been overwhelmed and overshadowed by our desire to exist safely in our own country. And I think at this point, it's very important to say that Nigerians should work closely with administration, pray, because we are beyond a point where we will point fingers now. Mm. We will but you just know, basically manage this transition. You know, on lookers, 2023, 2023, yeah, my apologies. So that we have another administration. Those looking from outside may not exactly understand how it is that, uh, you know, the authorities can't seem to place a lead on all of these that are playing out. But within the party, the leadership, the group, I mean, they expect you to have conversations and talk to yourselves, frankly, uh, behind the cameras. Do these kind of conversations actually go on? Do they have a clear picture of what Nigerians feel and what is really going on? We have, we have, we have said a lot about the internal mechanisms of our administration's um, dynamics. Uh, one thing I do know is that the presidents have a consultation forum with the party, with the National Assembly, and with other major stakeholders in the polity. What I do not know is what is it that has been discussed? Because if the party, as an arm of the democratic uh, success of the administration, 
represent the people. I mean, have every single presence in all the wards, in all the corners of the country. Then the party should bring a feedback to Mr. President on what is happening in this country. We do before we know exactly what is happening. This is just the party. I mean, the National Assembly have representation from all constituencies in this country. The National Assembly also represent us. And therefore, in that forum, I expected that feedback will be given to Mr. President and the Federal Executive Council on the state of the nation. And not only that, at the disposal of Mr. President are very important arms and agencies of the government. And therefore, we do not have to wait to hear this news from newspapers or social media. Intelligence, security architecture, policing, the military, and other paramilitary agencies are all there to actually have their ear to the ground and monitor what is going on. That is why I use the word overwhelmed at the beginning of my discussion. I feel that, honestly, whatever it is that we are doing, it's not working effectively because we are losing people and we are lo losing lives. And beyond that, we are losing our respect as a nation, not only in Africa, but all over the world. Countries around us that have stabilized their system and democracy and are growing, we always mention Ghana, for example, in our neighborhood, or Rwanda, or Kenya, in Africa. These are countries that are making good progress and the leadership has succeeded in stabilizing the country, securing the citizens, and growing their economy and bringing about development. Yes, Mr. President, get his respect all over the world as an individual. And I always want to say this, that as an individual, we have a very credible president. But as a leader, the president needs to do a lot more to transfer that credibility to the leadership of his government. Because at the moment, citizens are losing confidence in the way this country is being run. Unfortunately, it's leading to undemocratic activities, calls, and aspirations. And I want to say this very clearly. There is no alternative to democracy because the foundation of this government, the foundation of this country, is being rooted in a peaceful transition and transfer of power. Yes, we can be frustrated. We can be so much in, uh, in a situation where we start losing confidence in the system. But the system itself works because it works for many other countries and it has worked for this country. I want to say clearly that we should desist from any undemocratic act that will truncate this journey, a journey that has earned Nigeria praise all over the world, that has made us a shining light in democratic transfer of power and transition in Africa. We should sustain that. Yes, we have a problem. The way out of this problem is to organize ourselves, coordinate ourselves, and look for credible alternatives when 2023 comes. But before then, we need to put our heads together to help Mr. President and this administration to solve this very, very myriad of problems. And the government itself need to honestly listen more, come down from high horses, and basically identify expertise. Every single challenge in human life have a solution. The problem is who provides that solution and who think he has that solution. Expertise everywhere in the world is what solves problem. I think it is important that Mr. President identify expertise, not only within the security, but within the social framework and and, and the architecture of government to help basically provide relief to citizens. This insecurity is multidimensional. We have cried and cried regarding the service chips. We now have new service chips. The security has taken completely new dimension that citizens are now being picked from their homes and ransom is being negotiated and given. The more money you pumped into this problem, the more problem you harvest. So we need to sit down and think differently. Honestly, 
it is going to define, unfortunately, the legacy of Mr. President. Uh, and Mr. Mr. President Magaji, Mr. came Magaji. in as a general. We voted for him. If you can hear me, Mr. Magaji, two things I'd like you to quickly address here. Uh, the first, you talked about the system being overwhelmed. Uh, some people might say that the system doesn't look like it's overwhelmed. It, it does look like, um, you know, they have an idea of what is going on. Um, and then the second about getting, you know, more people to profile solutions. Just uh, a few days ago, we saw the People's Democratic Party saying, oh, we're shelving politics. We understand that this threat is existential and we would like to shelve politics and we would like to sit at a table and and see how it is that we can come up with solutions. That hasn't, that doesn't seem to have been received very well. But let me quickly uh, give an instance of uh, an instance where it, 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 this, a part of the system keeps warning people who wish to create anarchy or who want to create anarchy in the system. Uh, the DSS recently released a statement saying they will no longer tolerate those whose aim was to throw the country into anarchy. They affirm their unambiguous support to an indivisible, indissoluble, and united Nigerian state in accordance with the provisions of the Constitution. Should we really be getting threats like this or warnings like this at this stage? Or should we be seeing action? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the DSS are doing their job. They're supposed to safeguard the system. But the problem is... DSS should reflect on what is the cause of these agitations. I mean, we are in a political democracy. When DSS issued a warning, it's because people are agitating for something. The question is why and what is that something? At the moment, uh, like you have rightly said, I am very glad that both um, organizations that represent ethnic nationalities or religious bodies, and even the opposition politics, uh, polit political parties, have come out to say that, look, our suggestion is intentionally made as stakeholders. It's not meant to adopt an undemocratic means of truncating power or this process. And that has been made clear, which means we are now back to the, the suggestion of putting our heads together to get to the solution. When DSS said that we will not tolerate any act of anarchy, it's true that anarchy is not good for the country. But what they are not, not, what they are not actually recognizing is what are the causative and, and elements that resulted in people going to these extreme views that are basically broaching on the sovereignty of the states, on the integrity of governance, and also on the existence of the, our party in power. We should honestly work very closely with representatives of people, like I said, the National Assembly, the Executive Council, and the architecture of security to address a very serious issue. My fear is simple. The more we push back on the desire of people to live peacefully in their own country, the more we get reaction. I mean, in engineering, uh, we always say action and reaction are equal and opposite. But in politics, it could be opposite, but it doesn't come equally. It can come in a different and more magnitude. So I will say that, honestly, we need to face the social problems first before we deploy the forces and the warnings. The social problems is very simple. We are here talking about just our existence in a country that is ours, just our survival in a country that is ours. Just our peace, just our environment to do business, to, to cater for our family. Are we asking for too much? Is the country demanding too much from leaders we have elected? We need to be accountable to the citizens. We need to have responsibility. The whole essence of this foundation is the constitution. The constitution guarantees basic right to citizens. And citizens are asking for that right. So therefore, I think the pushback should be carefully <laughs> looked at so that we don't push people off the grid and then we get into the same anarchy we are trying to prevent. Uh, Mr. Magaji, one of the things that you, know, you have said indicates quite a number of um, in interventions that need to be deployed. But um, you cited some things that suggested perhaps political solutions. Now, you are not unaware, Mahopo mentioned it a little earlier, 
that a particular section of the political class have been talking about us all coming together to have conversations. The problem for me is not coming together. The problem is the process. How do we engage ourselves if we can't find a way to have these kinds of conversations? Uh, let's even begin from there. There is the National Assembly, and then there are people who are, and it's, of course, a good number of, uh, at least the, the, the APC and the PDP are dominant parties in the National Assembly. Do you see a role, a political role, for the National Assembly in stemming this tide? This is a very important uh, discussion because at the root of most of the problems we are facing, or we always go back to it, is when we are challenged as a nation, we tend to resurface in agitation for a different political structure and solution. I am honestly convinced that this country needs to be looked at again. The structure of the country is designed in such a way that we accuse each other and no one is better off. And I think, like you rightly pointed out, the question is, what is the constitutional process that can lead us to amicably and peacefully sit down and tell ourselves the honest truth? And the honest truth to me is simple, that we can accuse each other, we can point fingers. The question is, who is actually better off? I'm a northerner, I'm from Kano State, and I have been accused by colleagues and brothers in a very civil political discussion of dominating the polity, dominating the economy, and dominating the security. So I ask the question, if I dominate the polity, I have the president. Yes, I have the executive council and appointees that are constitutional, just like every other state. But what is my economic situation? And what is my security situation today? So the question is, is it working for me if I dominate somebody? It's not. The question is, look at all the indices of development. The North today is actually worse off. Security, education, prosperity, development, I don't know. What have you? The North is not very well positioned. In fact, other parts of the country that have been pushed off in opposition space have managed to organize themselves into a survival mode and come up with a credible economic and development model. So I will say to you that, look, I think this country needs to be reviewed, and I think need to be fairly and equitably structured. I've always advocated for what I call development federalism. Development federalism, in my view, is a consensus by the six regions and Abuja to create a development template over time and devolve power gradually to the regions and to the states. The truth of the matter is, we all need to go back to our states. If all the states are working, the federation will be working because development is not in isolation. Everywhere you go, it's either a local government or the state. So if you devolve power to the local government and to the states and then create an economic investment template in the form of development federalism, which basically brings the potential of South-South to be an oil and gas hub in Africa, we will stop importing petroleum product. We will stop importing things that we should be exporting. And we will become net exporters of that product. The Southeast, we all know, are very ingenious people with technology, manufacturing, and trading. Please, let us invest heavily. Let us leverage on our resources to and raise the capital to invest heavily in manufacturing so that we don't import things from India. We don't import things from China. We import and we produce these things we need for agriculture and for our transportation and other industrial machinery in the East. It's doable. I've been to Newi. I've been to the industrial hub of Aba. I have seen what the East can do. We will be proud to say, made in Aba, produced in Aba, made in Nigeria. And we will all be proud citizens. And the economy of the East will be a net contributor to the center. The same thing with the Southwest. Southwest dominantly is a manufacturing and marine economy. Singapore is exactly like that. And therefore, if we develop the marine economy, the ports and the manufacturing base of the Southwest, we will be net exporters of goods and services and service providers in marine. And therefore, the Southwest economy will become net contributor. If you take the three regions of the North, Central, East and West, and you take the three countries of Cambodia, Thailand and Vietnam, 
our economy is almost the same then. So, and these countries are booming individually. If you invest today in these regions in agriculture, agro-processing and organized market with the standards for export, standard for feed in Africa, we're even lucky that the African continental free trade agreement is in effect. We have the whole of African market to ourselves and the world. We will be one of the richest regional zones in Nigeria. Therefore, the North will now become net contributor to the center. And Abuja can maintain our sovereignty, can maintain our identity, can maintain our defense, can maintain our currency, and we raise the flag. Now I am saying honestly, the structure of this country is not working. I don't want to be accused even when I am suffering. I want my people to wake up and rise up and feel proud, just like every other Nigerian will feel proud when that sense of ownership is created. We should review. After all, the amalgamation has expired and the constitution is being reviewed by the National Assembly. So the question is, what is the process? Now there are three different dynamics going on. The first one is the National Assembly has set up a very, very credible committee reviewing the constitution. The question is, can they change Nigeria to a point where they can change the such that the structure can say, we don't want two bodies in the National Assembly. Can they do it? We want to save cost and have only one unicameral body. Can they do it? So can they meet the aspiration of this change? Waking up wow. for, to create a platform for this competition. And the third one is the one we don't want. It's eruption. It's anarchy. And that is important. And when, when you mention that DSS is talking about anarchy, I get very worried because we are almost there already that citizens are advocating for change in an undemocratic way. It's not where we want to be. So the government of today should actually honestly review its position and the National Assembly, as I said, with the political parties, both PDP and APC as the major parties and other parties, to sit down and say, how do we do this peacefully? We all love each other. We all are Nigerians. We all respect each other. At individual level, we all have friends across the whole country. And honestly, everybody wants to have a giant, functional, proud country called Nigeria in Africa. Not only Nigerians, the whole black are looking up to us. To leadership. We are better up together but we need to have a functional structure. In the, uh, but we'll be back in just a moment and get uh, some of the matters, all bids seeking a solution. We're back in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back. Well, Mazum Magaji is an APC national stakeholder. He's also, he was a member of the APC Presidential Campaign Council for 2019. Well, the, the views that you've expressed, uh, you know, there's so many who uh, they say resonates with them uh, at the moment, just reading through several comments. But the thing is, if there are several other people up north who have views such as yours, then they ask natural question. So, why are you not speaking up? Are they actually talking to the presidency to understand that, look, this is what people hear, this is what people feel, this is what people think should go on if we need to pull together as one? Well, I, I think, honestly, this is a process. This is an evolutionary process for us in the North. You know, I mean, decades back, if I sit down here and say to you that, I want this country restructured. If I go back to Kano, I probably will be uh, you know, stoned or, 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 or harassed. But I can tell you now that the reality of the country's structure is down on everybody that it's not workable. And this is one of the factors that made us realize all of that. We used to think that it is about getting a super leader, a credible leader that can move this country forward. And we actually bask in the Europea of, oh, he is our president. And I think in history of this country, there was never an individual, and there still has not, we haven't had one, that has enjoyed the support of the ordinary people, that has raised the hope of everybody, that has the credibility to say that 
his individual credibility will rub on the country leadership than President Muhammadu Buhari. And the North rooted for him for decades and spent money and time and invested so much in his becoming the president of this country. Today, we are discussing all the challenges the country is facing under the same President Muhammad Buhari. So we are coming to the realization that it's not about individuals now. It's about the system. It's about the fact that the system is cobbled in such a way that there is what I will call a pull him down syndrome. There is internal squabbles for power and positions. There are forces working counterproductively for the way the country move forward. And all of those forces emanates from those regional dynamics. The sense, real or otherwise, of marginalization, the sense of domination, the sense of um, um, opportunity and patronage is uh, skewed to one part of the country or one ethnic groups. And all of these perceptions are becoming reality in our life. Reality in the sense that there are examples we can show. Another most important thing was that the president was perceived to be, like we said, a general, but also a very, very credible anti-corruption crusader. He has stated this, he has demonstrated this, he has lived this. And now we are witnessing that the system can actually leak and can invite people who can actually be marauders that can wreak havoc on the system. Unfortunately, the president's capacity and individual integrity did not stop all of that. So we are coming to a point where we are saying, you know what? It's not working anymore. And I'm not alone yeah. in this. I can assure are, are you. Making there are quite excuses. a number of young... Are you, are you making excuses for the president? Uh, because there's people who will say that he hasn't quite exercised fully uh, the, the position or the, the, the powers that his office bequeaths on him. So, for instance, you talk about uh, agitations. Uh, the people who have talked about appointments, for instance, um, how the appointments the president has made is not reflective of the diversity of the country. I mean, when you look at the ethnic uh, uh, groupings, for instance, that's one. Even women complain about how they, they have not been sufficiently represented uh, in the president's cabinet. Let's even take the cabinet or, you know, not, not an out talk of the government in general. So has the president exercised to the full extent the credibility that he brought on board, the powers that his office bestows up, up on him? Have we fully explored that first? Uh, the fact that, you know, oftentimes things happen, we don't get to hear consequences. Uh, Cabinet reshuffling hasn't exactly taken place. I could see in other administrations, not that they yielded, muted much fruit, but at least it would seem that there was some uh, consequence if there were, uh, there were any reportage for, you know, misdemeanors or questions to be asked about what was going on in ministries, departments, and agencies. Have we seen that yet? I have just said to you that one of our despair is that the president hasn't manifested as the General Muhammad Buhari we voted for. And therefore, like you rightly observed, Mofe, that he has not applied himself as his attribute, as he was known. In fact, we always joke within the cycle of a young generation that we voted for General Muhammad Buhari and we have President Muhammad Buhari, two very different people. And uh, honestly speaking, the, 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 you, you've always highlighted that, oh, cabinet uh, appointments or positions is skewed towards a section of the country and people. I can tell you one thing. We are complaining about that too. What is important is it is skewed towards incompetent people. There are people in this administration that are not capable of managing their space. They are brought we have a history of this administration. There were days we discussed about cavals running this country. We all knew many, many people came on board during those days and how they came on board. I'm sorry to say that is where the foundation of the problem started. And because this administration, like you rightly pointed out, has not restructured itself, has not purged itself of some of these people, we still live today paying the price of those people's incompetence. It is unfortunate 
that honestly we are suffering. Look, you can say anything you want about that it's our party, it's our government, it's our president. Yes, the KPIs are very clear. The KPIs after six years, we have only two more years. Next year by now, it will be full political storm in this country. Nobody will be talking about the president's and the development agenda. I am telling you, it is time for stock taking. As a party and as a government, I will say that we have lost a golden opportunity to translate those personal attributes of Mr. President of anti-corruption, military experience, and his passion for the poor to lift people out of poverty, to secure the lives of people, and to fight corruption in this country. How widely shared are these sentiments that you express so boldly on television? How widely shared is that within the ranks of the APC? Oh, Mope, I want to tell you that I actually was relieved of my position as Commissioner of Works in Kanu because of the same view. And I still stand by them. This country should be ruled democratically. This country should be ruled equitably and justly, and competent people should be brought on board our administration so that we will not be in this situation we are discussing now. And I want to say something very important. As much as we keep talking about what Buhari should do, I want to let especially generations from my age downward know that this gentleman had been around for 40 years. Um, Nigeria has given them everything. Most of the generations in power today were around 1999. So I will say this very clearly, another bold statement. I'm calling on young political generation, young Nigerians, to find a coordination platform, not to agitate for an anti-democratic changes, but to harness our energy towards a very credible democratic change we will not and we should not succumb to the political machinations of these generations that has put us in this situation. We must find the platform at our local government level and at our state level to coordinate ourselves. We are greater in number and democracy is about number. We should find a common ground and we already have, and the common ground is simple, a functional, respected and democratic Nigeria. We need that to happen. And the only way we can do that is to do two or three things. One, at our local government level, start organizing ourselves, women and youth, and take positions of party and contest. At state level, that is the most important uh, part of this federation. We're doing our best in Kano to coordinate young people to create the necessary shift in the paradigm of power and the change we desire to see. You know, in Nigeria, we need to apply ourselves properly so that we make a bid for the leadership of this country, even as other elders are also making a bid for it. There are only two outcomes. One, we negotiate our space, or two, we win the space. If we do this, this we can change Nigeria. But before we do all of that, we have to agree on a one democratic indivisible, restructured, functional, and respected nation. You know, I, I did ask, I might quite did ask as well, if there were several other people who shared these views, first within your party and uh, uh, up north, uh, cross board perhaps. But, you know, listening to you, I mean, I see messages on my phone asking me, am I sure that you're a member of the APC sharing this kind of views? But speak to this school of thought. Uh, where some always tout and bandy the impression that no, that uh, well, that uh, insofar as uh, per perhaps if a Christian or a Muslim, in this case a Muslim is the president, uh, they think that well, people will always agree with whatever is said. And then some other people then thought that well, look, you can't have anybody who has this kind of views exist in their numbers up north. And some others think that well, actually, from what you have said. It does suggest that uh, it may not necessarily take a lot to get people on the same page in this country because there are mindsets across different parts of the country, even across religion, that they can actually sit on the same table and work together 
and pull the country, the country in one direction. Do you think that that can actually happen, especially in the light of all the agitations we see today? Yes, I am very positive that uh, a lot of people, both in the north and in the south, are looking for a better Nigeria. What is happening, however, is that a group of very few Nigerians that have evolved over time and mainly product of military transition have hijacked the political and economic space of the country. And they have carefully, carefully designed a process of elimination and isolation for any credible, competent Nigerian that want to participate in contributing to this country's development. And I am not joking about this. I know many professionals that have volunteered in 2015 that came from abroad, diaspora Nigerians, to contribute selflessly to the change that we voted for so that this country will be a better place and respected all over the world. They are witness to the comments, to the treatment, and to the situation Nigeria is subjected to outside and therefore they are all frustrated and wanting to come and make a change. But I can tell you, unfortunately, as the transition unfolds, we had three dynamics. We had the president, whom we voted for, gave mandate to, and we have the party and the people, the ordinary people. The social contract was between the ordinary people and Mr. President. The first time in Nigerian history that actually people voted and their vote counted was when President Mohamed Obari came into power in 2015. And that social contract was tempered with, with the insertion of people we do not know on campaign trail, we do not know in the party, we do not know with Muhammad Buhari in his cycle of aspiration to become president. And once that came, the power shifted. And therefore, special interest and vested interest grew in our system that resulted in isolation and elimination of ordinary people consigned to the sufferings of so many harsh policies and party stalwarts who have worked very hard to ensure this president became president. And also, inviting people who were basically non-existent on the campaign trail and whose background and history was known to be the architects and the designers of this country's problem back into our system. So I am saying that the president has become president his legacy will be written. He has a golden opportunity, two more years, to do the needful. I think I have stopped advising because, honestly, I think he knows what to do after six years in power. And I will just pray for him that he succeed in solving this security problem, turning around the economy, and bringing about respect and development to this country as a giant of Africa. I will pray for the president. But beyond praying for him, I am asking for a very serious affirmative action by our generation to map a political path for a better Nigeria in a structured manner and in a democratic manner. Well, that is indeed a good place to anchor Mazu Magaji, APC national stakeholder and a member of the APC Presidential Campaign Council for 2019, and he's an engineer. Thank you very much indeed for your time and perspectives this morning.